Hey, boys and girls, Doug Childs here. It's Warriors, Rich, and Wow, man. What's happening, Doug? Boom. Psalms of War. That's what's happening. Prayers like are literally it. kick ass. It's uh, number one on Amazon, Middle Eastern literature. The Kindle's number one uh, in the Kindle section on, uh, or in rather, Middle Eastern literature. Both of them in Middle Eastern literature uh, on the number one spot and the number two spot, respectively, for new releases. Not too bad, man. And uh, Rich, That's awesome. in meditation worldwide, all the books on meditation worldwide, this one, the last time I checked, was number six in the world. That ain't too bad, bro. Uh, that's pretty awesome, actually. Uh, <laughs> especially uh, when you know how I write in my brutal uh, Paul Bunyan type style. So Psalms of War is out. It's a great book for the holy warriors on your list, uh, guys, this Christmas. And um, let's talk about one of the uh, Psalms. David, David uh, he, had a, he had a messy uh, Christianity. He had a messy walk with God, <laughs> uh, Rich. He was, a, he was a guy after God's heart, and uh, God loved him dearly. He loved God dearly. And um, David said in Psalm 129, he said, You know what? The enemy has been uh, plowing furrows in my back ever since I was young. He, yeah. had, uh, he had his brothers. They hated him. Uh, King Saul uh, was jealous of David, tried to kill him twice. A big chunk of the people of God. Uh, uh, followed King Saul, and they too wanted David dead. Welcome to church, right, Rich? Yeah, exactly. So you got you got the people of God right up there with the Philistines as being a major pain in the ass for David. And um, here's how it kind of plays out. Let me set the stage for you, Rich, on this one. Here's how it plays out nowadays. When first someone gets saved, everything's new, everything's wonderful. It's a honeymoon, refreshing stage. You want to tell your story. People want to hear your story. It's a wonderful exchange. Like I said, it's kind of a newlywed kind of feeling. Then all of a sudden, God gives you a vision or you do something for God that other dullards cannot or would not do. Then the sweet fellowship you enjoyed with the Brothers Rich evaporates like a pack of smokes at an AA meeting, and it gets replaced with envious Christians, Richard, that are praying for your ruin. That's so, the weirdest thing ever. And uh, uh, I, I bet, you know, I'm not a betting man, but I bet that people didn't tell, or I bet that pastors didn't tell their kids that at their youth group. So David's intimacy, intimacy and his exploits for God drew out the worst in the people of God. Some of them loved it, and uh, but make no mistakes, others, and again, we're not talking about Philistines. We're not talking about the Amalekites. We're talking about the people of God. They yep. hated his guts because of his zeal and God's unique favor on his life. And David said that these folks prayed for his ruin in Psalm 40, tried to kidnap his soul, according to Eugene Peterson, and got a kick out of making him miserable and, bu and booed and jeered him without mercy. So this podcast is for you, the believer, if you're going through similar gobbledygook from the people of God, as David did in Psalm 40, uh, then please put your ears on because we're going to walk through some horrific stuff that happens, again, by the hand of the people of God to people who are just pursuing God. Rich, what do you think, man? Yeah, I think that gossip is one of the, we were talking on a previous podcast that you don't have to intentionally um, be serving the devil to be one of his ministers. And some people in the church who call themselves Christians, and they may be Christians, are uh, doing the ministry of the devil. Uh, the Bible says um, the devil is the accuser of the brethren, and that means that's his job is to accuse us. But when you do his job, you're actually a minister of Satan, whether it's intentional or not. And Proverbs 17, 4 says, evil people relish malicious conversation. The ears of liars itch for dirty gossip. And so an interesting thing about gossip is many times the people that are speaking it, they know who to say it to, and they know who not to say it to. So remember, if somebody is gossiping to you, they have already determined your character. You should right. be offended that they see you as one of them, and, and you should call them out on it, it, it even if it's the closest friend. Our, our friend, Dean Curry, him and I were 
having a conversation one day, having, you know, having a great talk about some stuff. And a guy came up that we both know and we talked about it and stuff. And I text him later and I said, hey, bro, I just want to tell you there was some information that I shared that was gossip. And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not a gossiper. I asked you to please forgive me. Please forget I said that and don't ever repeat it. And Dean told me later, he said, in over 20 years of ministry, I've never had one minister or Christian ever talk to me later and apologize for gossiping, not once. And, and I, I'm not trying to brag. It is by the grace of God, but I don't want to be the person who's saying negative things about other people, right? And so me and this guy, we had some problems. Okay, but that's not what we were talking about. And I had no right and no reason to bring up those things because they're between him and I. And we have had the conversation. But still, he is a child of God. He is a member of the body of Christ. And his attitude towards me doesn't determine whether or not he goes to heaven because I'm not in that line. It's him and Jesus. So what I did is I repented because I was convicted. I still don't like the guy, Doug. What he did was still wrong. But it doesn't, re it doesn't give me a pass to start to say something negative about him because he's one of God's kids. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Winky Prattney, uh, one of our favorite ministers, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> when when he was really you know full throttle in it back in the mid '90s, I had a, a buddy of mine who spent a lot of time with Winky, and uh, again, I I cut my teeth on a lot of his stuff when I was a wee lad in Christ, and I was like, you know, tell me, tell me, tell me what Winky's like. He goes, you know what the most interesting thing about Winky Prattney is? I'm like, lay it on me, Spencer. Give it to me. Give it to me. He goes. I've never heard him. He goes, and I've been all around the world with him many times, many occasions. I've never heard him once say anything bad about another minister. That's impressive. Bro, I'm, you know, my, my problem is I got a big mouth. Now, I don't, I don't uh, pitch myself as a gossiper, uh, but to me, you know, crap is crap no matter how you frame it. And, um, Right. And I and I and I speak out, you know, and it's it's just the it's just the bent of the wheel. Um, I would I would love to. I remember one time, man, this guy, this guy very nicely who had a, had a real prophetic edge on him, who loved Mary Margaret and I. I haven't seen him in about 20 years, but our path separated when we went to Miami, but he, he really loved Mary Margaret and I really, uh, you know, was, was a good influence in my life. And I remember uh, talking smack. I think it was about uh, Jimmy Swagger, or no, Jim Baker. So when Baker did what he did mm -hmm. back in the PTO club, I was like, blah, 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 blah. And um, he looked at me, Rich, with the, the kindest eyes, kindest look. And he said, Doug, you better be gracious. He said, because the same thing can happen to you, you know? Mm -hmm. And you don't want to learn that lesson. And I remember, man, I, I, it it like froze me in time. And right. he and he didn't say, you know, he didn't join me. He didn't scold me. He's like, tread softly, you know, because. Right. <laughs> you know, we all, we all need grace, man. We all need that's, grace. That's a tip. A similar thing happened at dinner one time. And I was with Pastor Cesar from Colombia and a minister that we knew that was used to be under him. Very close friend of mine. He fell into immorality and he was out of ministry. And this young guy that was a newer pastor hanging out at dinner, he goes, yeah, I can't believe that guy did that, blah, blah, blah. And he thought he was taking sides with Pastor Cesar. And Pastor Cesar looked at him and he was saying in Spanish and he was telling him, he said, hey, the only difference between him and me is the grace of God. And he said, be careful when you speak things about people like that. And then tears started flowing down both of his from both of his eyes down his face and he said and i love him very much and i miss him and bro like whatever was getting started got destroyed in one second by someone who knew about the grace of god and understood about gossip and how that could turn a whole conversation and a table of ministers start speaking with with tongues of fire the bible says they're lit on by the the, the tongues are set on fire by the flames of hell itself. And he cut that off. And not like you said, not by a rebuke, but a reminder. 
about God's grace and who we are, and we weren't going to have it. And so, you know, that kind of stuff, that's that's the heart of the gospel right there. Yeah, you know what I, uh, and just examining the whole gossipy, slander, judgy, judgy, you know, type Christian type stuff, um, uh, both, you know, my temptation to enter that kind of fray and that kind of vapid conversation is basically because, you know, uh, if and when I do it and, and when other people do it, I see it because of just great small mindedness and envy. Like yeah. somebody who's somebody who's busting their ass, somebody who's working hard for the Lord, somebody who's you know got big vision, big picture. They're not down in the weeds, talking about you know little small town. You know, well, did you hear? Or did you see? Did you know? Will I? I imagine no. Nobody's nobody who's busy. Nobody like Nehemiah who's building the wall. Nobody's doing something great, and glorious. Has time to listen to that. That yeah. childish little crap, man. Nobody does. And another thing that, that I've learned, just again, examining myself when I do it, it's like, am I so insecure that I have to yeah. bring somebody down to push myself up? And, um, right. you know, I just don't want to be that kind of person. We all have uh, temptations to do this. Uh, it's, it's filthy. Uh, gossip is right in there with murder, uh, sodomy. Uh, you know, the, the worst sins on the planet and bam, there, there's gossip right there and, and gossip, uh, and all the stuff that people were saying again, mostly the people of God. So harangued David, like his Psalms, his imprecations are filled with maledictions against those who are, uh, talking yep. smack about him. Listen to this one right here in verse 14 of Psalm 40, your favorite Psalm brother. Uh, verse 14, David said, let them be ashamed and confounded together that seek after my soul to destroy it. Let them be driven backward and put to shame that wish me evil. And again, this is not just Philistines. This is not just the Malachites. Right. This is mostly the people of God is who he had to haul ass from uh, predominantly, right, Rich? In, right. Uh, and then he also and, says that. He says, Samuel. why are you so downcast, oh, my soul? And when he's talking about that, it would have been fine if it was my enemy, but it, it was you, my brother, and we used to walk right. to the temple together. That's that's yeah. rough. Yeah, and you ate food in my house. You know, yeah. I mean, David's like I fed you. I uh, went to went to church together. You know, I'd do anything for you, and you're the one having the biggest hee haw, uh, hoping for my demise right now. Verse fifteen, uh, David says, "Let them be desolate for a reward of their shame." That's saying to me, "Aha, aha." So David's not taking this lying down, which is so rich in in regards to you know the the you know the veracity of the imprecations uh, coming through rich the hermeneutical filter of the cross. You understand? Um, of course. Should should we be praying this stuff, man? Because David said, "Well, bless, or God or Jesus said, bless your enemies, uh, don't curse them uh, that bless you, or the, don't curse them that curse you, bless them that curse you." David's saying, um, "Make them desolate." Make them be ashamed, confound them, uh, let them be driven backward and put to shame that wish well, me it, evil. It's funny you say that because um, when, when you read about the application of the blood of Jesus, right? Like, so the during the Passover, they killed the lamb. The blood was in a basin, but that blood had no effect until it was applied. And they dipped the hyssop in the, in the blood and they applied it to the door, right? And then the angel of death would pass over and the people inside that house were saved because of the shedding of the blood of the lamb and the application of the blood of the lamb in faith, right? So Derek Prince teaches on that and he says, uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, they overcame them, is 12, 11, right? They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And he says that in the New Testament, the blood has been shed by the blood of the lamb by Jesus. The blood is in the basin. It has no effect on your life until you apply it to your life. And he says, the, your confession is the New Testament hyssop, that when you confess the blood, you apply it to your life. Now, you know, because we believe in our heart, we confess with our mouth, and then we're saved. And so he talks about that. It's a great thought. But then later he talks about in Hebrews, and, and this is a long way to get where I'm saying to answer what I believe is a good answer to your question. Um, I'm tracking. They said, uh, the blood of Jesus speaks better things than that of the blood of Abel. 
So we know blood speaks, right? The Bible actually talks about that. Life is in the blood, blood speaks. So when Cain killed his brother Abel, the Bible said that his blood cried out from the ground for justice. Now, when we read in Hebrews, Jesus' blood speaks better things than that of Abel. And his blood speaks mercy, right? And so mercy triumphs over justice. That's the gospel. We have the law, and above the law is the presence of God, and the blood of Jesus is over the law. And so we get mercy from the law by the blood of Jesus, right, if it's applied. So this is the great thought on that. So should we pray the, the imprecatory psalms? Should we love and take care of our enemy? Well, the answer is yes, but this is really cool. When you apply the blood of Jesus, this is what Derek Prince said, when you apply the blood of Jesus to any situation, even over your enemy, what you're saying is, if he will repent, Lord, to you, not to us, if he will repent, bless him, give him mercy. But if he refuses to repent, when you apply the blood, the blood cries out for justice. So the Old Testament isn't canceled by the New Testament. We know it's fulfilled by the New Testament. And so Abel's blood didn't stop speaking. Jesus' blood speaks something better. The law didn't go away. Jesus' blood forgives us from our sins against the law of God. And so those things do work together. So when we pray, and, and I do this in a practical way, if I have an enemy, I apply the blood of Jesus to their life. If they will repent and get right with God, then God have mercy on them. And if they don't, let the blood of Abel cry out for justice in their life. So I know that's kind of a long way around, but I think it's important. Yeah, you look at Paul uh, <clears throat> in 2 Timothy 4, he's uh, given his final salutations to his young uh, charge, Timothy, uh, before he gets his noggin uh, removed for being a bold witness uh, to the grace of, of God. Paul tells Timothy, he's like, hey man, I want you to, I believe it's in 2 Timothy or Philippians, I don't know. It all is a blur, uh, Rich, as I, as I age like a fine wine. Anyway, he, he's, he's telling people, he's like, hey, man, bring Mark because Mark's profitable for me. Uh, Demas has departed. Uh, Titus has gone someplace. And he said, um, you know, so bring the books also. Come and let's have a, you know, a, a final brouhaha before I get decapitated. He said, uh, oh, and by the way, there's this other guy named Alexander the coppersmith. He did me a lot of harm. May the Lord repay him. Yep, there it is. I mean, David and, David here in Psalm 40, Rich, David, it, again, he's not talking about, you know, I'm in the Valley of Elah and, and Goliath's woo, 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 swinging his sword right. around and, uh, and, and it, <laughs> it looks bad or the Philistines are hounding me, you know, or Saul and his guys are chasing me like a flea on a dog's back. He's just being... Uh, uh, have, he's just having rather smack talk about him. Uh, people who are wishing that he would fail. And in, in verse 13, he says, deliver me from this God. Make mm -hmm. haste to help me. So again, it's, it's, it's real weird because this is not a physical threat. This is just right. ill wishes from a bunch of jackass people of God. And he's like, yep. deliver me from this stuff, man. Make haste to help me, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. And that's, and, and I believe in that. And you know, here's the crazy thing about it. People can attack us. They can attack us. They can attack us. But if they will ask for forgiveness, they should be met with forgiveness. A lot of times they won't. But I've seen people that, I've had people apologize to me, Doug. I, I got to tell you a great story. So in my church, there was a guy attacking to me and saying a bunch of garbage. Anyway, when I went to go to the Philippines, he said, we are connected to ministers there. And when you get there, they're going to confront you. And I said, well, apparently they don't have Proverbs in their Bible. And he said, why is that? And I said, because the Bible says if you grab a mad dog by the ears, <laughs> you better watch out, baby. And I said, I'm that mad dog. They don't want none of me. So I went over there. Pastor says, our, we were outside of our network in, in this other group of pastors, this large group of pastors. They had about 1,500 pastors at a meeting, their top pastors, and their pastor of the whole organization was there ministering, and Pastor Cesar was there to preach. They invited him. So Pastor Cesar is preaching. Doug, he, he's supposed to preach three hours, like a couple sessions, right? 
After an hour, he literally walks off the stage and he goes, Rich, preach, and walks out the door. He didn't ask them if it was okay. He just told me what I was doing. But I know him, so I already had notes on my laptop just in case. I went up there. I started ministering on rejection in the spirit and that kind of stuff to all these pastors, right? Next thing you know, something's going on that I don't even know what it is, bro. Like the head guy comes and gets on his knees and starts weeping. Pastors are getting on the stage and they're all crying. And I realized this has nothing to do with me. Whatever the Lord wanted me to speak got to them. They have something going on. So they were fixing something in their denomination. They didn't care to share it with me either because it's none of my business. I just did my part. So while they were doing that, I was like, this is my chance to get out of here, right? Get back to the hotel. It's jet lag. So we're hauling butt out the back. And, you know, my guys are with me and we're going through there. And this guy says, wait, 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 stop, stop. And he's just weeping. And he says, I just want to talk to you. I said, hey, great, man. God bless you. And he says, no. And he grabs him by my arm. He pulls me back and he says, I was one of the pastors that was supposed to confront you. And I stopped and I said, oh, don't worry, man. I forgive you. And he just dug. He starts weeping. He said, what you ministered right now is exactly what we needed. I want to ask you to please forgive me. I got him and I gave him a giant hug. I said, I don't know what you did. I forgive you anyway. I love you. God bless you. And I took off because that's what Jesus does. You know what I mean? And I, I wasn't personally offended. I knew that it was some bigger political. I don't care about that. But if people will accept the blood of mercy, we can forgive them. Unfortunately, too many of them don't, right? So we also shouldn't take personal offense. We should be like, God, deal right. with these stupid people. And that's what David did. David's like, I I'm not going to do anything to him. I He's the king, Doug. He can do whatever he wants. Think about having the power to go, you, you, and you, you're dead tomorrow at noon. And he says, Lord, you justify me. You answer the question. You answer the accusation. So that's, that's powerful. Think about how many people, if they had the power to physically shut up their enemy, they would do that rather than turning them over to God, which right. is really a heart of justice, not a heart of revenge. Yeah, and you got God, uh, you know, he goes forward <laughs> or he goes in front of you, man. He's your rear guard. He's there to sort that kind of stuff out. If you're his special yep. girl, if you're his special boy, it's like David said, he goes, look, if I'm doing something freaking evil, if I'm doing something unrighteous, then, you know, aside from just being, you know, intrinsically uh, bent towards sin and uh, all of us, you know, falling short of the glory of God. But David's like, if, if, if my hands are clean, God, then, you know, I'm yeah. asking for some defense. And uh, I think it's, I think it's, um, Interesting to me when when uh, when you launch the imprecatory prayer, first and foremost, it's a it's a spiritual weapon against yeah. spiritual forces of darkness. And uh, you do stupid crap, Rich. I do stupid crap. We don't want to be smote <laughs> because no. we do because we step out of line. Uh, what we do want to be uh, smitten is the powers of darkness that encouraged uh, you know. Uh, a bad idea or a bad action uh, to be exercised from our psyche mm -hmm. and we're, we're not listening to them anymore. Same thing goes for our enemies. You know, just like you said, it's, it's like if they can be salvaged, then Lord salvage them. Right. If, 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 uh, if, you know, if, if them getting confounded, if them getting ashamed, uh, you know, pinches their flesh for a little while and yet it brings them out in the light where they repent I've been there yeah. a gazillion times, okay? Been there many, many times, and I'm thanking God that he didn't pour forth wrath on me, but he chastised me. He uh, he let me beat my own self up uh, many, many times, and then I came around, you know? I'm all yeah. ears, Lord. I'm listening after the affliction. So we got to hope that same thing with uh, the crap talkers as well. I want to be rich, just like I said earlier. I want to be... So focused, big picture, big vision, working for God that I can't, like Nehemiah said, he's like, I, I'm not going to stop and listen to Sand Ballot and Tobiah. You know, right. he's got their little freaking letter. You know, I've, you know, now that I step back into to, uh, ministry, I have people all the time, you know, sending me letters. I mean, six, seven pages on something that I said about the rapture or... <laughs> Or, or or something else in Romans seven. It's like, I list, listen. I appreciate the you know the deep thought and and the work and stuff. I don't have time 
to have right. these kind of conversations. And I don't even have That's right. uh, uh, a church of 2,000, 3,000 people, man. I can't imagine. Well, I, I'll tell you a story, and this just happened a couple weeks ago. And and so as I tell the story, I, I'm not putting this person down. This is a member of my team. This is somebody that I love very much. And so there's a woman on my team, and she she gossiped, right? And uh, she gossiped to another leader who let us know and said, hey, this is what's going on. And so I let her know, uh, I think text or email, I don't remember, but I let her know, hey, I understand that you were gossiping. I don't want to know what you said. I don't care what you said. What I want you to do is I want you um, to do a five-paragraph paper on the destructiveness of gossip. I want you to read the Bible. And she said, well, I want to meet with you. I want to sit down and have a meeting. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, we can have a meeting. I will do all of the talking. You will do all of the listening. What I want you to do is I want you to go read what the Bible says about it. And so she was obviously upset, wanted to defend herself, you know. And so this is a very this person's very close to me, you know, member of our team. And so she sent me the study. I didn't read it. And we went to our leadership team. So it was our leadership for Yuma and Phoenix, and we were all together on video, right? And I said, um, can you open that up and can you read what you wrote about the dangers of gossip? Now, remember, I haven't read it. She looks at me in shock. She had no idea. So she starts reading it. Bro, it was one of the most convicting. I was convicted while she was reading it on what I was correcting her. It was one of the most convicting and powerful and concise studies. And then the end of it was apologizing to the people that she had gossiped to. And she was telling them, for those that I said serious things about, I I would like to meet with you and apologize to you. Bro, I I could cry right now thinking about it. There was a hammer, man. It was a hammer. You know why? Because nothing is more powerful than the word of God and the blood of Jesus. I I didn't want to, I wasn't mad at her. I was trying to help her. The best way I know to help somebody is with the word. When she got into the word, she couldn't argue with my attitude, my mood, my words. When she got into the word of God, because she loves the Lord. You know what she determined, Doug? One is that she was a person who had a lot of insecurities and a rejected spirit. So she felt rejected by people. Because she felt rejected by people who didn't intend it, she became offended. When she became offended and she was alone with anyone, she was just expressing how she felt. But when she studied the word of God, she saw that it was that rejected spirit opening her life to offense. And then that offense, the devil was using it for gossip to attack my team. And again, like I said earlier, you don't have to, you don't have to intentionally work for the devil to be the messenger that he's looking for. And, and everyone, Doug was telling me how powerful it was. And I'm so proud of her. Like, I'm so proud of her. That's what we do. It's not that you're not going to mess right. up. It's when you do, let's go to the word. Yep. Hey, send me that. I'd love to read it, man. Sounds awesome. I will. I will. I'll send it to you. You'll love it. Yeah, again, uh, uh, gossip and slander, it's its not a light thing. You know, when no. I've been guilty of it, uh, the Holy Spirit has, woof, man, he's, he's lit me up. But again, we've got this totemic view, Rich, of vice to where it's like, yeah, you know, depending on what your brand of Christianity is, cigarette smoking, you know, right. whiskey, um, homo sapiens or homosexuals. And, Bad um, words. And then, <laughs> yeah. Caitlyn Jenner. And you got this whole, you know, this totemic view of vice. And then down here, you know, gossip, slander. And uh, God's like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> uh, it's it's right there in the big ones. You know, yeah. sodomy, murder, uh, filthy lucre, gossip, boom, right there in the big middle of it. Because like you point out, man, it is the soup du jour, 24-7, 365, man, of El Diablo. It's what he does. Yes. He accuses the brothers. He talks uh, about the saints. And then when you do it, he's like, well, I'm just being a truth teller. I just have I'm justified. A, I just have a prophetic spirit, and I just can't help myself from telling the truth. It's like, no, right. you're, you're a gossiping little small-minded snit, and the thing that you should do is go repent to the people uh, that you're talking uh, smack about, and then ask God for 
mercy, for yep. cleansing, and then ask him, lastly, to give you a vision to do something great instead yeah. of being a small little dipstick in the weeds, uh, hoping that people who are trying their best to serve God uh, get confounded or God blows them off or something. What kind of weird ass existence? Yep. <laughs> and and you know what, what they're trying to live like that, brother. They're seeking acceptance, and like you said, they want to look better. But the devil always lies to us. He isolates you, gets you in a corner, and he beats you up with shame, and he lies to you, right? When the truth is, when she was in the light and admitted and asked for forgiveness, everyone's evaluation or estimation of this person was up here. Like it went way up. It didn't go down. And the devil tells you, oh, no, they're going to hate you if they know who you really are. No, no, they won't. We're, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. It doesn't mean we're never going to not argue, but they're not going to hate you. Your, your stock goes up. And, and yeah. something you were saying, Doug, you said that on the lists, you know, of things, gossip and slander are bad. In Proverbs 6, 16 and 19, two of the seven abominations are liars and gossipers. Hello. Six things the Lord hates. Seven is an abomination. And two of the seven are lies and gossip. Right. Which also people should note that just because it's true doesn't make it not gossip. Yeah, Because exactly. it said liars and gossip. So those are two separate. It's like, things. are you passing information on about somebody else that's meant to disparage them or hurt them? Then you know yep. what? Uh, when I do it, when you do it, when whomever does it, when an angel does it, it's a freaking sin. Yep. I had this person the other day uh, come up and it's like, Aaron, just just vomited some stuff about this person. It's like, you know what? I don't care. I don't care. I don't even want to talk about it. Can you not ever bring that up in my presence again? Uh, yeah. I, I love them. Everybody's got their struggle. You know, let's, can we, can we just like clear the atmosphere of that kind of talk? I don't want to do it, man. Again, I remember one time um, I was with uh, Leonard Ravenhill and uh, Mary Margaret wasn't with me. This other guy was there and he wanted to bring up you know, some gossipy crap about uh, some interpersonal problem in the presence of Leonard Ravenhill. And I'm going to guess that was a bad idea. <laughs> Dude, I think I told you the story before. He stopped him cold in his tracks and he said, you know what? I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about intercession. I want to talk about revival. I want to talk about world evangelization. Do not bring that kind of small-minded, little garbage, little snitty, you know, nitpicking type stuff about you know some interpersonal relationship in mule shoe texas don't do it in front of me and i was like oh man that was that was an awesome uh reply from the old prophet yeah that's powerful and scary i'd be thinking man i'm glad he did it before i did it <laughs> i mean the the small mindedness i'm glad that guy right. was stupid before i yeah. was <laughs> yeah yeah because I was right, I was right behind him in line. <laughs> yeah. uh, what I'm seeing interesting in the in my book, the Psalms of War prayers that literally kick ass, is that God defends uh, His kids, and David was a hot mess, man. But God defends His kids. Yep. And that's that's something you know that um, there's no spiritual authority nowadays, Rich. Everybody's <laughs> their little independent. You know wow. they, you know they. Uh, People call themselves Christians. They don't have any kind of authority over them. They don't have anybody rebuking them. Nobody speaks into their life. Don't go to church anywhere. Even when there's, you know, uh, fair to Midland churches that they could attend. They don't do it. They're an island to themselves. We're Texas, man. We're independent. And um, you can't find that in the scripture. And what I've, what I've seen with uh, 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 some folks is that they, they very freely just talk crap about uh, anybody who is trying to do something for God, but it's not the particular way they, Rich, would like it. Or and, they would do it, except they yeah, won't do it. So they probably yeah. need to shut up. Right. Uh, um, so anyway, <laughs> what, what I'm, you know, it, it brought me back as I was writing the book, Psalms of War, and just seeing, you know, God defending David against Philistines, God defending David against the people of God, is that if, if you have a guy or a girl that's heart is after God, that's in a place of leadership, not saying that you can do it to somebody who's not a leader, but really has an anointing, ascension gift on it, on them, and you go after them and you start saying stuff uh, against them, God takes it up as, as his case. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I was uh, I was um, looking in Second Kings two the other day, and Elisha just gets the anointing, man. You know, Elijah, boom, chariot to fire, woof, right into heaven. And um, so he's going about his business, you know, getting ready to start raising dead people and ministering. Hadn't really done anything yet. And these kids start mocking him and calling him old ball headed. And, yep. uh, <laughs> and, and Elisha uh, sent a curse to them and killed 42 kiddos that were mocking uh, God's uh, chosen leader with she bears, according to the King <laughs> yeah. James Version. Yeah. Freaking awesome, man. That's terrifying. Yeah, talk talk crap. Talk make fun of his haircut, you know, make fun of uh, you know, something he did in the his past. Make some make fun of something she did in the present. Go ahead. Go ahead. Here come the she bears. And um, I'm telling you, man, uh, I don't want to be there. I've done it. Yeah. I full throated confession. I don't want to do it anymore. I want to be possessed with his vision, his dream, what he's called me to do discipleship evangelism and yep. building the good society uh, in this mucked up world. Anything else than that? I don't want to talk about it. It's bull. That's good. It's pedantic. It's below uh, any kind of noble pursuit. It's period. Temporary. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had a situation with a pastor when I was young in the ministry and I, I don't recommend anybody doing this and I'm not glad that I did it, but I want to express what my thoughts were on it. And I said, I'll tell you what, let's draw a line between me and you and ask God to judge and kill whoever has the wrong heart. <laughs> and, uh, Split the kid, man. And the guy says, what, what are you talking about? Are you crazy? I said, nope. I'm just telling you before the Lord right now that if I'm wrong, my heart is pure. And if you can say the same thing, let's draw the line. Let's call. No, I'm not. Don't even, right. you know what? I'm not even talking to you anymore. And he took off. But, and I thought later, because I wasn't saying, let God ju judge who's right or who's wrong, who has more authority. or let I was like, let God judge our hearts. If I'm wrong, I, I have a right heart. I don't understand what's going on. And he was hauling butt out of there, man. He's like, whatever's going on, I don't want to be a part of it. But I realized later, I was like, well, it's probably not the best way to go about things. But, <laughs> but I think the most important thing is any, in awesome. any situation is to make sure that your heart is right with God. Yep. And, uh, and once that happens, then what's right and wrong and and not according to the word right and wrong, but who's right and wrong in a, in a, in a discussion is less important than our yeah, hearts so what being do you, right with God. So what do you do, Rich, when um, uh, you hear, hey, oh, so-and-so said, uh, Rich sucks worse than an airplane toilet. And, and it's somebody you know, and they just do a direct whammy. And then, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get to a place now where I don't, I don't defend myself. Mm -hmm. I just tell God, I just tell him, you know, just like, like David said, here they are talking mad smack. And, and David just says, God, let them be ashamed and confounded together that seek after my soul to destroy it. Let them be driven backward and put to shame that wish me evil. And right. then he just keeps doing his own thing, you know? Well, when I was a young man, um, those things bothered me a lot, a lot. I had people start web pages against me. It would keep me up at night and and it's almost, it's embarrassing to say now because those things that consumed me back then, I wouldn't even care at all now. I, I literally wouldn't care. Not because I'm so righteous. I've just grown through that stuff, right? And uh, I remember during that time, my pastor told me, he said, you know, the reason that the criticisms hit your heart and why you can hear them is because your other ear is open to the compliments. And he said, because you're listening to the praise you're subject to the criticism. He said, for me, when people praise me, I bow down and I tell the Lord, they don't see you, they see me, that's for you. He said, I don't do it physically. I will say to them, thank you. But in my heart, I acknowledge the Lord every time and I tell the Lord, they don't see you, that's for you. And he said, and right. when, they hate, when they hate me, I bow down and I say, Lord, that's for you, that's <laughs> yours. They, right. they don't see you, they see me. And he said, I, I don't accept the praises, I don't let them get to my heart. So also the attacks, they don't touch my heart. And I remember hearing that thinking, that's dumb. It's because I'm a warrior, I'm a fighter. And the truth is, is he had the exact same temperament as me. And he was trying to give me the many years down the road. And, right. and so even though I didn't accept at that time, I listened. And so as I was growing, so now when people say stuff to me, I don't, I don't care. You know what? I'm, 
In a lot of ways, I'm better than what you think, and in a lot of ways, I'm much worse. So I, it, it doesn't. Yeah, I like how. Uh, yeah, I like how uh, John Stott. He was a, approached by the f- former uh, pastor of Westminster Abbey in London, <clears throat> and he was being nice to him because uh, Stott had just uh, preached there, and he came up to him and said, "Oh, what a wonderful message! And um, man, you've just had an illustrious uh, ministry here in Europe uh, through books and through preaching." And uh, Stott said, well, if you really knew me, you'd spit my face. <laughs> Dude, how I could relate to that, right? <laughs> so awesome, man. I think, you know, again, uh, I, I think, brother, just getting to a place, you know, if, if just you and I, you know, and you can hold me accountable, and the Warriors and Wild Men uh, guys, you know, hold each other, the guys and girls accountable. If we just start speaking life, not, not yeah. that we're Pollyannas and we, we don't deal with, you know, difficult issues— and things that need to be confronted and rebuked, but we just don't talk. Uh, we don't talk smack. We go forward. We preach the gospel. We heal the sick. We raise the dead. Uh, we're good Samaritans, and uh, just let all the other stuff, you know, uh, be water off a duck's back, and um, just realize that it's satanic, it's evil, and um, and don't be crushed by it. And if you got to complain, complain to God about it. And ask him to uh, uh, shame and confound yep. the ones who are, uh, you know, doing the crap talking. Well, I'll tell you, this is this is a, a personal thing, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, and I had never thought about it till this moment right now. But I like you pastoring, Doug. I think it's great because it comes more from a heart of being in the trenches with the people than from a lectern at a seminary. And uh, my old pastor also told me, he said, never stop pastoring because it makes you relevant and it makes you compassionate. And so um, I I always love the stuff that you say. We always have great conversations. You know that. But I think even more today, just having this conversation, because you were there dealing with people and with that humanity, it's bringing that pastor part of you out. And uh, I I think it's awesome because it's it's a great balance. Yeah, I hate it. Yeah, it's good for us. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's uh the other day it's like well you know it's like lord i'm in this I'm gonna do it and throw my whole heart soul into it treat yep. it like i'm preaching to 10 gazillion people and um and people are like are you sure god's called you to do it it's like yeah i i really i really am now yeah like so so how i go because i didn't want to do it just absolutely and i thought it was the devil you know, talking me into something like this. Because I wanted to do any and everything but this. And I just couldn't shake it, man. Just could not shake it. Well, God's grace is on that for sure. And and I've said this before, is that the ministry that God used me in to rescue other people, he used that same ministry to turn around and rescue me, the responsibility of the ministry, the responsibility of the people. Because remember, we talked about that in Proverbs, that um, when people cast off uh, vision, where there's no vision, people cast off restraint. It says people perish, but another version says they cast off restraint. And having a vision will constrain you and restrain you. And so in my most difficult times, the things that I wanted to do that I was so mad about, they were not possibilities. They couldn't even be considered because I still had this ministry that God gave me and did not relieve me from that responsibility. So it constrained me and restrained me and saved my life, my relationship with Jesus and probably my physical life. Yeah, I believe it, man. Uh, I I think even though I'm still uh, Doug through and through, I really like uh, this Doug. And I know I'm talking about myself in the third person, which probably makes me a psychopath or a sociopath or something like that. (laughs) I really like where I am in my current local condition than uh, when we were crushing it and making gazillions of dollars, man, uh, 10 years ago, you know, because I didn't care. I just absolutely didn't care. Cared about, you know, Mondo themes, other stuff. uh, I wouldn't give it two seconds of thought. And uh, then God said, you know what? Uh, I've got a new gig for you. (laughs) Yeah. You're a preacher. You're going to go back to preaching. That's great. And I was, I love brother, it. I'm telling you, man, I was like, no way. And you know a lot of this because I'd, I'd be calling you on the phone. It's like, no way, man. Yep. This is not God. I think it's Satan, you know. 
and God didn't kill me. And here we are, and the things uh, growing, glowing, and going, man. That's right. Cigars Let's get and some sermon. people saved. Get people saved. Exactly. Do what we do. I love it. All right, what do we need to do, big dog? Besides, go to uh, Warriors. Don't gossip. Yeah, go to Warriors. Yeah, don't gossip. Go to WarriorsOfWildMen.com. Subscribe. Um, if you're listening to us on other social media, that's great. Um, but make sure to subscribe, and then we'll send you one or two emails a week, let you know what's happening, keep you connected. And if you want to help support the ministry, go to the War Chest. It's tax deductible. We'll send you the information on that for those that are doing it. Appreciate you guys. Love you guys. Warriors of Wildmen out.